Community is everything. All right. Remember that, everybody. It's, it's basic to our human nature, and it also works really well in the podcasting space. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 16, Scott Johnson. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Don Coven. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell to support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Techsploder podcast. I am your host, Jason Howell, sitting down with my friends, talking about technology, the things that fire us up about it. Sometimes we get into the topics of, you know, the direction of technology and the things that we wish we still had that fire. That's definitely come up on previous conversations, but it's all fair game. This is the show where this is like the one part of my kind of like consistent weekly thing that I do nowadays that has nothing to do with news. And I quite enjoy that, actually. Don't get me wrong. News is great, but sometimes it's it's nice to take your foot off the gas pedal when it comes to the newsy stuff. Today, I am joined by longtime friend on the internet and just an amazing guy all around, Scott Johnson, an excellent artist who's produced the Extra Life comic online since 2001. Also, someone I consider to be a pioneering figure in the podcasting world, over two decades of experience in tech and culture podcasting, starting with Extra Life Radio back in 2003. That was a year before the term podcasting was even coined. So good on you, Scott. Uh, <laughs> launched the popular World of Warcraft podcast, The Instance, in 2006, which that only ended a couple of years ago. So that was a long player. Mm -hmm. uh, later founded the uh, Frog Pants Podcast Network in 2009, going all in on podcasting, uh, creating many shows you probably heard or watched, The Morning Stream, Core, Film Sack, and then also a regular uh, guest on the Daily Tech News Show with a mutual friend, Tom Merritt. Welcome, Scott. Welcome, indeed. Thank you for having me. It's really great to see you, man. And I, I feel like we've been promising to to hang out for a lot of yeah. years on air somehow. And uh, we did it. I mean, outside we of all it. the normal channels, it's finally just, it's just Jason and me, you know? Yeah, Jason and Scott. It feels good. Reunited. Okay, <laughs> Pardon, pardon my uh, the question mark floating over my head because no. this could be one of those situations where I ask a question that I feel stupid because I didn't remember the answer and you did. Mm. But I'm mm. relying on you remembering the answer here. Um, have we met in person and I'm just and I just see you entirely online because that's how I've seen you like 99% of my of our careers. Well, because it's been so many times that way, it can be easy to forget. But we did meet. At least once in Las Vegas, Nevada in 2008. It was um, Vegas. Okay, it would it have been Vegas. Vegas. Yes, yeah. you're right. And I remember... Okay, so 2008, I, okay. That yeah. was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. And what I <laughs> you know what I remember most about meeting you was... Um, and I'd already been... I would been, had been listening to Buzz Out Loud, which was still going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking into wherever we are all in this some space. And I, I think maybe... I think it was Veronica who introduced us because I'd known her for years and years. And... I walked in and I went, oh, someone else in here knows what it feels like to be the tallest guy in the room. <laughs> and uh, we were yeah. similar height, you and I. And so when I saw that, I got excited because I was just like, oh, my gosh, Jason's as tall as me. He understands. He gets it. He knows what it feels yeah, like to get it. to block people's view and not mean to. And, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the wrong movie theater, we really make for a miserable time for certain people and, and this sort of thing. Yeah. And, and so for me, that was like a big moment of like. Ah, uh, one of us is, you know, he understands, he gets it. And uh, that felt pretty I good, do. I have to admit. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I totally do. And I'm sure you've had the experience as a fellow tall person that the times, the very few times that you actually end up in physical space with someone who is actually taller than you. Mm -hmm. And so that's weird in and of itself for me. Yeah. And then if I get into a conversation with that person, it's like, 10 times weirder because I spend all of my life looking mostly downward when I talk to people. Yeah. And when I look up, it's enough to distract me. It pulls me out of the conversation. It's like, I kind of can't like focus on the conversation. I'm just focused on the weirdness of that 
sensation. Yeah, it's weird. And I, you know, again, it's in some ways being tall, being really tall is kind of nice. You, uh, you get picked on less in school. At least that was my experience growing up. Um, I went from kind of average height. I got teased a bunch and then suddenly I became six foot one or two and the end of junior high. And suddenly all that bullying stopped like dead <laughs> stop. And I even then kind of realized I'm like, really, this is all it takes. You just get tall and then people like what a primal, weird human thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yes. Very strange. But as I've gotten older, um, I kind of forget sometimes like I'll come into an intimidating space uh, of some kind. Let's say I've got a stage thing to do or something like that. I do not feel like the tallest person there, even though I often yeah. am. And then people will come up after and go, you are so much taller than I expected. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're all tiny little people here. Look at all how small everybody is. And I wish I would think of that in the moment because it makes me realize, well, yeah, I've got some stature that uh -huh. is pure physical, pure uh, superfluous. It really doesn't matter. No. But it makes me at least feel like I can, you know, see a little further, uh, yeah. see the entirety of the room, not wonder what's way on the other side, because I can actually see that over the top of people's heads. So I don't know. It's a it's a weird thing. But my memory in 08, when we ran into each other, or when we first met there, I think it was the podcasting expo in Vegas. OK, um, you I, I was thrilled because I was like, oh, finally, someone understands someone gets it. You know, I am so I, I apologize first of all that I don't have a, a specific memory of this moment. And <laughs> like as I like I remember I remember being at the podcast expo sometime around there, but mm -hmm. just don't, don't feel bad. My memory is awful. My wife can attest to it. I I don't remember that many things that I should definitely remember. But as we were leading up to this thing, I was like, man, like. I want to say maybe we've met in person, but if we did, like, why am I having a hard time, like, recognizing the captured memory of that? You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. I can't play it like it's a movie. At, in 2008, like, I know there was some some involvement of you with us in the Buzz Out Loud world at mm -hmm. 2008. Were you come? Were you ever coming on as a guest at that point? Uh, emailing in? I know like, I was, was sending, the uh, there were calls coming in a lot from me to okay. begin with. And then there were some guest spots that happened. Um, Tom or Molly or somebody, it may have been mm -hmm. Veronica said that, Hey, you should come on and we're going to talk about this thing. And it was, maybe it was heavy gaming related or maybe it was art related. I don't remember what the deal was, but sure. so I did a couple of those spots and I think all of you were there for those. Uh, but also there was this Scott from Salt Lake City thing that was going on. And Buzz Out Loud had a lot of this, right? Like a lot of yeah. uh, regulars from certain places. So you'd always know their yes. name and the place they were from. Uh -huh. And so I was participating in that way. And then uh, from there, I want to say the, the big significant thing was the very following year after we met briefly in Vegas is yeah. the year I announced that I was going to yes. start doing Frog Pants full time. So I came on that show, your thousandth show. And I do remember that. I do yeah. remember that. Yes, absolutely. And then announced it while I was hiding in an office at the company I worked for so nobody could hear me because <laughs> I didn't want them to know yet. And, and uh, they didn't know yet. And you mm -hmm. were in that. Meanwhile, you were announcing it like on this CNET, by the way, not not yeah. a, like a, a tiny little, oh, no one's going to hear this sort of thing, but like on the CNET network. Yeah, it was significant. And the fact that I did that and didn't tell them was it, it felt dangerous, right? I felt like yeah. I was like, you know, breaking some kind of rule. But I, I think they saw the writing on the wall. They knew that I was, um, you know, inching toward this or this this would be part of my my life plan is to figure out this and do it on my own. And the truth is I probably could have done it years before, but I was chicken. Um, so it's yeah. Hard this, to step off the ledge, man. Yeah. And so when I did that, I don't know if, I don't think I ever followed up on this, but I announced it on Buzz Out Loud, 1000th episode, made a big deal out of it. And then, and it was video too. You guys were streaming yeah. that one. And I went, as soon as it was over, went in the other room, sat down with my immediate uh, supervisor and said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm giving my two weeks. And they were upset. They were just like, no, you can't go. We'll do, what if we paid you and like all this extra? I'm like, well, you could have done that five years ago. Why, why now yeah. that I'm threatening yeah. it? It was that whole thing, right? But I was feeling yes. very empowered thanks to this, you know, announcement you format had this, this wonderful yeah this wonderful <laughs> spotlight shown on you yep. an audience you had a whole like 
studio tv studio remote to you mm-hmm. applauding the announcement no. like, yeah, yeah like so excited for you that had two what effects well, you yeah. went right from there and put in your notice That's yeah so i did amazing. and it, and it was that. a two-pronged approach or a two-pronged benefit because on the one hand i i knew if i did this in such a public way that i would i would make sure i did it in other words it was like a it was added motivation to stick to it, regardless of how scary it might be. Yeah, right. Um, it t- turns out it wasn't all that scary, and I'm kind of annoyed with myself for thinking it was. But, but, but there was that, right? I had to hold my own feet to the fire because, I mean, my, my goodness, I got on this thing and announced it to the world. And then it also just gave me all the confidence in the world to tell everybody at work to kind of shove it because I was leaving. And uh, at the end of it all, like the only regret I have about any of that is that I didn't do it earlier. And that's it. Yeah. It's the yeah. only thing. Oh, man. I mean, in in doing what I'm doing right now and, you know, even prior when I was still at Twit, I was I was heavily considering this for quite a while. And sure. you know, we even had a conversation kind of about it because I really wanted to talk to people who had done it before to know, like, what am I getting myself into if I do this? Mm-hmm. What are the things that you would tell yourself if you were, you know, to take what you know now and go back in time and all this stuff? And I don't know how many times I heard that. Just do it. Just mm-hmm. step off the ledge. The yeah. hardest part is stepping off the ledge. You'll figure it out. And I still, by the way, I, I feel like I'm still figuring it out. It's, you know, what is it? Nine months later uh, since I was laid off, you know, I had planned on putting in my notice um, when they laid me off. Um, mm-hmm. So it was kind of the timing was about, you know, it was very uh, symmetrical, like, or, uh, you know, coincidental that it all happened at the same time. But yeah, it still could have done it much sooner, but I chose not to. Yeah, it's one of those things where it is difficult to know what's best in the in the moment, like what what should you do for you and everyone around you? And the difficulty in that is deep, like you don't think about all the possibilities of if I leave now, what does that mean? Um, and if I, if I do leave, then, you know, if you're feeling loyal and I have this problem, I was very loyal to the people I was working for and with, Sure. despite the fact that I'm not sure they were that loyal to me. Um, it didn't matter. I had this false sense of loyalty and uh, I've talked about this a bunch on my, my diary podcast, just sort of working through the idea of why I was always like that. I, I just felt like I had to stick with it, uh, for as long as I could. It was like my commitment to do that. And I, and even though they don't really have that commitment for me, um, I felt like I just had to be that committed. And now that it's all over with, I realize, yeah, you probably could have, you probably could have been fine if you would have just left earlier. And you know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, everything's 2020 in, in, in hindsight, but also I did feel like the timing was right. A little bit like you, like, you know, you're, you're worried that, you know, is this the right time or am I, am I going to put in my, my two weeks? Is this the wrong time to be doing this or whatever? And then to have them come to you and say, well, this is all going to change whether, whether you're ready to or not. There is, well, it's just kind of a great way to kick your butt and get you moving. For you know? sure. So for sure. I, I think it's awesome that you, uh, that you really, I mean, I, I noticed this immediately when, when those layoffs were announced, my first thought was, well, what's, how's, how's this working with Jason? How's he doing over there? And what I saw was somebody who was like, all right, I'm going to take all these skill sets yeah. that made everything look and sound so good over there. And I'm going to be able to do that stuff immediately with my own content. And it, uh, it shows even on this stream run right now, it's like, I need, I need a Jason in my life to get my, my lighting right. You know, <laughs> I admire that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it has definitely been a, uh, what's been interesting for, for me is I did all these things for all these years for Twit and for CNET. And there was a certain point at which I took my foot off the gas pedal of the production stuff. So like the cameras and the lighting and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and became more of the host type thing Mm -hmm. and doing this now i'm doing it all and so i really had to re you know re-educate myself and be like all right this stuff's important to me now again it's important to this working you know and and then also realizing and recognizing like what's essential and what's not Mm. you know there's a lot of things when i was let go and kind of like starting to execute this plan where i was like all right i need to be topmost quality everything needs to be shot you know beautiful blah 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 and then i've just kind of realized over time it's not like things need to look you know can look crappy and that's fine mm-hmm. but there's like 
there's only so much that people truly care about. At the, at the end of the day, they just want to be entertained or mm -hmm. they just want to be informed or whatever. And the other stuff is nice to have, but not essential. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's been a, been a total learning, uh, work in progress, learning along the way, still have a lot to learn, but yeah, the nice, that. the nice thing is I feel like more than ever, we're in a technology jungle that works really well for the kind of content we make or that you and I are interested mm -hmm. in making. And whether that's, you know, drill down and be real specific about, you know, technology as a broad topic, or in my case, it's a real mix of stuff. I've got a, a morning show that is basically a variety show. I have video game focus shows during the week. The instance, which ended two years ago, is about to start again tomorrow, in fact. Oh, um, my goodness. I was not aware of that. Yeah, that's a great, great that's place. Awesome. Yeah, great place to, to, to mention that. Although, um, I've kept it kind of low key. We're we're gonna we're gonna relaunch it as a monthly, but there's a brand new expansion coming out. World of Warcraft's uh, hitting a bit of a crescendo. Um, I just did a very cool thing out there with them that I can't talk about until tomorrow. Um, that I NDA'd for, but uh, a lot happening tomorrow in that regard. at the point of this recording. <laughs> yeah, by the, the way. point of this recording. With, people yeah. probably have seen it if they're in that world or all or, or follow that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Once um, this is live and published. Yeah, so go 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 find Scott on on the interwebs. You'll you'll find what he's talking about. Yeah, if you're on if you're on any kind of social media and you follow like a Warcraft or a Blizzard account, you'll probably see it tomorrow. That's my thinking. Yeah, uh, don't know what time for sure, but anyway, the um, uh, I'm excited about that. And there's all of this stuff happening at the same time. And if you said to me, "Hey Scott, could what about running all of these like you run them ten years ago?" It would have been a lot harder even just 10 years ago because the mm. tools and the workflow and the the sort of, um, oh, what's the word? The, the confluence of technology that kind of comes together to make using it, publishing it, sharing it, all of that stuff has improved in really big exponential ways that um, going from idea to production to putting it out there is such a better uh, workflow than it used to be. Oh, and I, so and I love it. In. Yeah, it's a great time to be doing this stuff. Everyone always says, well, are you, just, are you nervous? Because, you know, this is now becoming a younger person's game. This is when all the, the early 20-somethings start taking over Twitch and YouTube. And, you know, this is, this is their domain now. And, and my answer to that is building community is everyone's domain. And it's their responsibility to do it. And it's harder than you think. Um, a lot harder. Like I remember when you and I were kids... Everybody I knew wanted to be Michael Jordan. And they all thought, well, if I play enough basketball and I practice and I'm on the school team and all these things, I can be right. Michael Jordan. And the truth was their, their percentage chances of even being considered by the NBA were so low, astronomically low, that yeah. there was no real probability that they were going to get any of that done. Well, today, it's worse. People look at like top streamers, top YouTubers, that sort of thing. It's a very, very small top of the heap percentage and it has to do with timing and all kinds of factors that oh, you can't control. Yeah. And so this idea that you can come in here and go, I'm going to be the next big name in streaming. You're, you're kidding yourself from a billions to one kind of ratio. So what you should do instead, so here's, I guess, a little advice, is focus on the two, three people that listen to start with and then focus on the next four that wandered in and give them a great experience and then focus on the next 10 that come in. And before you know it, you'll have smart, wonderful people that are helping you just by being there, be mod helping mod your channels or helping talk in discord when someone has a question or whatever. And before you know it, you are building real community and real community equals a support base that will make it so you can do this stuff for a living. Yeah. And that's the manageable, reasonable way to go up this hill I don't think there's any such thing as, I mean, there is such a thing as overnight success, but most of the time overnight means overnight disaster. And even if it means sustainability, it's so rare that you chasing after that is you're just going to disappoint yourself. So yeah, Scott's big advice of the day, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, don't, you know, don't try to solve everything all at once and be the biggest thing ever. Start small, cultivate what yeah. you have and move from there. For sure. I mean, I think what what uh, occurs to me there is that I think since the beginning of my experience in podcasting, community was always the thing. Mm -hmm. Community was 
so incredibly important and instrumental to why even Buzz Out Loud was what it was. You know, mm-hmm. half, half the fun of Buzz Out Loud, yes, was Tom, Molly, and Veronica, and then later me, you know, kind of our banter on show, whatever. But when I think of Buzz Out Loud, that's a part of what I remember. The right. other part was the fact that everybody that watched and listened and contributed as a community member, they all became characters in you know, Buzztown. I mean, we even had a name for it. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, I have this this mental image of this like cartoonish land called Buzztown that has, you know, uh, <laughs> what what was it? Spectacle Fest in one corner, and you know, all of them, all of those characters, Remy and and, and everyone, uh, um, uh, just playing a role in mm-hmm. that. And that's kind of like the epitome of the community driven media model that has been podcast up until now. And that's, that's certainly, you know, proving to be really important to me as, as I do what I'm doing right now, there is no overnight. And, and like you said, if the overnight happens, that's great from a momentary standpoint. It must be nice to see those numbers suddenly shoot up and everything. But right. now you have the task of appeasing a bunch of people who still don't know who you are mm-hmm. and still have no relation to you other than that one thing that brought them through the door that one time. And at this point, more than ever, there is so much competition, so much distraction. People are more distracted now than they ever are when it comes to the media landscape. You got the only way you hold on to them is that community engagement. Oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And if yeah. you learn the sooner you learn that lesson, the better because they're. It turns out they're not just random viewers who pop in and pop out, right? Say a quick thing and then leave or whatever, or throw you a few bits on Twitch. These are yeah. human beings with lives, interesting stories to tell in their own right, and some of my greatest friendships on this planet are virtual. I've never met them in real life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not that far from that list. Like we met the one time yeah. in 08. Yeah. You could barely oh, remember I mean, it. So, I, yeah, this is almost two decades ago at this point, Scott. <laughs> yeah. And we talk all the you time. Know? We've collaborated yeah. before. We do totally. all these things. Like that's totally. that's a that's a meaningful foundational interaction. Yeah. And when you build yeah. that with your audience, it's sometimes exhausting. I'm not gonna lie. It's sometimes it's very tiring. It's like, well, I've got my real family and my flesh and blood friends, but I also have this group and there are days where I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I can't even think straight. I've been talking to so many people today, but Mm -hmm. it is the business. It is the, it is the, the, the thing that drives it. And without it, we don't have it. So I'm very, I feel very fortunate, very lucky and also just honored to, to have it in my life. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, It was really um, kind of along these lines. It was really interesting. Your last week, at the time of this recording last week was the Made by Google event. And mm-hmm. uh, so I was in Mountain View. I was invited to go to the the event for the first time instead of covering it remotely, which was really great. But while I was there, I walk into the big auditorium where everything's happening. And, you know, all these people who I've had on my podcast a million times, you know, we've, we've seen each other on the screen. Maybe we've seen, seen each other at an event once or twice. And uh, one of my great friends, like I consider him a friend, even though we had never met face to face, Juan Bagnell, um, some gadget guy, some people might know him as, and I saw him and it was just like, like it was, it was kind of emotional. It was like, Oh my God, like we have done so (laughs) much stuff together, but all online in this virtual space. And now here you are, you're a real person in front of me. It was just, it was so cool. It's, it's awesome when you get the opportunity to, to have that moment after, you know, being kind of like that virtual, I hate to say virtual because that makes it sound like it's not real, but right. that kind of distance through a screen kind of community, it's it's nice when you can finally kind of close the chapter or or I remember, you know, with Buzz Out Loud and the, uh, I think it was the thou- thousandth episode in Genie, mm-hmm. who was just legendary in the BOL community, really helped, you know, a lot of coordinating the community stuff happening behind the scenes. And there she was in real, the best. real life. Yeah, she's the and, best. She still shows up every morning for my morning show. Are mods you that I have not heard from her in so long. She's and amazing. I like cross paths with her. I got to check in with her because she was she was wonderful. Yeah, I'll let her know. I'll she's... let her know later. I was on here because she'll want to check this out. She was she's amazing, and she is a perfect example of yes. cultivating that kind of thing. And then what they end up being for you is so much more than just a listener or a viewer. Uh-huh. They end up being a trusted advisor and friend and someone you can count on 
Yes. And she's she is 100 percent that. I mean, maybe the greatest example of that in the community. And the fact that she I mean, I'm, I have I think I have BOL to thank for for her showing up at all. Yeah. Because of that yeah. crossover. And she's just been amazing since. So, yeah, the I mean, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but it's a very lively, no. happy horse. You're going to slap this horse a bunch of times. Community <laughs> is everything. All right. Remember that, everybody. Yeah. It's it's basic to our human nature. And it also works really well in the podcasting space. Yes. Yes, indeed it does. Um, Real quick before we move on, the job that you were at when you announced that you were moving on to Frog Pants, what do you mind if I ask what you were were doing? No problem. So I was a graphic designer for a company that made... Okay, you were doing uh, graphic design. Yeah, they were doing like, it's very boring, but they were a cable harness company that bought or that manufactured cables in Asia, brought them over here, sold them under various names. But my job was to create a bunch of marketing material um, catalog stuff. I did all our online stuff, all our web stuff. And, uh, what else? Anytime there was like, a, an event or something, I would, you know, do all the paperwork for it. It wasn't mm. exactly tapping into my full potential, but it was, all, it was a, it was a good job. But it job. was graphic design work and yeah. you're an artist and I'm getting paid for my, my art, even if it isn't art the way that I would prefer to do art. Yeah, and anytime someone would come across our table like, oh, we need a video short to go on this Comcast channel thing we're doing, uh, they'd come to me because I knew I knew this stuff. Um, yeah. Or it would be like we temporarily ran a small, uh, I, say, I can't remember how that worked, but it basically it was just like a, a video thing and we had a deal with Comcast, so it showed up on local cable and had something to do with the core business, but also was trying to branch out. Anyway, all of that stuff they would throw to me uh, because I, I tended to, if, if it was technical in nature or visual in nature, I was your guy. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, mind you, working half my life was spent doing podcast stuff at home, which really started in like 98, 99 when an MP3 first happened. Yeah. And I realized Did I they could, knew about this. Oh, yeah. They knew. At they that, knew I was doing point. it. Yeah. yeah. They knew I was up to it. And it was never an issue. Like they were never. In fact, some of these people would come to my events that I would hold for fans and stuff. So there was always a little bit of crossover there. And I think they always kind of admired what I was up to. But there was always this feeling of like, we're going to lose him to that. Uh, and they were right. Well, yeah. yeah, they were right. <laughs> yeah. It's bound to happen. Gone. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take a super, super quick break. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk. One thing I love about this show is I have kind of like a little bucket of, of fun kind of like tech nostalgia questions that I always love to get the answers to. And I'm super curious to know what you have to say about some of these questions. That's coming up in a second. All right, let's go back in time a little bit. Go back to when you were a kid, because I'm I'm assuming that your technology kind of passion began when you were much younger. And I know that you're big into video games, so uh, that's probably a great place to start. When you think about being a kid, and like I know later came the World of Warcraft thing, and you really built a, a large you know chunk of your career around that in in essence, but. When you were a kid, like, was there a, a particular game that kind of kind of, that you can kind of draw some sort of connection or correlation between what came later and and where it began? Or well, or game that... gaming as a as a subtext of technology overall is always I felt like has always been a part of my life, and it's because when I was a kid, I, I probably I think I would have been seven or eight when we got our first. Um, Space Invaders cabinet in the house, and the reason we oh, did that got is a cabinet. Yeah, my dad. Oh, so you were balling. That's well, awesome. it's it's great because I went through all all of junior high wondering if I had any actual friends because they would all just come to my house to play my video games. <laughs> but you were that house. <laughs> it was definitely I that I house. Knew, I knew someone with that house. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's always a kid who has something rad, and everybody goes there. And I think I was yeah. that kid. But um, oh my goodness. The, anyway, awesome. the way it started is my dad was starting our, an arcade business. Um, he felt pretty strongly in the late seventies and eighties that this was going to be a growing thing. And back then it was all about arcades. And so he started opening arcades. So two or three local mall locations, uh, here in the Valley. He also had a, uh, a cocktail style cabinet, uh, you know, Pac-Man or Galaga or something like that in every pizza hut from, the tip of the state of Utah all the way down to Southern Utah. And I used to go on weekends with him and like get the change out of him, do some maintenance work, that kind of thing. And so we were all up in that. He even got to the point right before the games crash of 85, the arcade crash, I should say, 
um, he was he was starting to do manufacturing. So we had contracts with like Data East and some of these Japanese game developers. And then he would bring their boards over here to the States and then build cabinets. Uh, I even did some art for one of the cabinets. Anyway, that was a big deal when I was 14. No kidding. But it was like always around. Video games were a part of our livelihood, our, our you know, my dad's business, my my whole life. It was just a thing. And, you know, while other kids would slough school and go up in the mountain or something, I would slough school and go to the arcade. It was just hmm. what you did. So um, that plus we'd have the consoles that would come out here and there. I had an NES, of course, very early and that sort of thing. And I've had pretty much everything ever since. But very early on, the entirety of the, the entirety of the video game business was like injected into me as uh, how do I put this? It wasn't just, hey, there's games to play. That's fun. Every kid thinks that. It was more than that. It was here is a form of t- both technical and artistic expression that is wholly new, that has never existed before, and cr- and can create experiences, worlds, stories, experiences that are unlike any other medium humanity's ever had. Um, the closest you get is you know a kid playing with rocks and coming up with a game and calling it checkers or or whatever. But in video games, these virtual spaces, even the most basic Space Invader days all the way up till now where we have huge sprawling worlds with stuff to do in those worlds, um, those represented a new kind of um, frontier. And that frontier was just starting then, and I feel like we're still exploring it, and I find that endlessly fascinating to this day. That's what drives me in it. It isn't about, dude, you play that game, it's pretty good, huh? It's not like that. It's more like, what is happening on the macro level? What company is doing what right now? And what does that mean for the future of this? Right now, AI is all the talk. So what does AI have to do with gaming? I follow that stuff really closely. And about what innovations are coming, where the missteps are happening. Uh, Mostly NFTs were a misstep in gaming Hmm. and went nowhere. But AI innovations are going somewhere. And in ways people don't even know about. I find all of that stuff way more interesting than just picking up the latest title and playing it. I do enjoy that. That's fun. But to me, this has always been this frontier space. Uh, A little like it might've been when man was exploring the rest of the planet for the first time in a meaningful way on boats and whatever, or when we get to space for the first time or whatever human exploration there is. This one is one of those. And it's the exploration of creativity and, and craftsmanship and technology coming together with art and, and storytelling and these kinds of aspects of gaming are to me endlessly interesting. And I think that's why I gravitate toward, well, why I've always gravitated toward it. I just find it so, so interesting. And a game like World of Warcraft, in a way, is the coming together of all of that, everything I've just mm-hmm. said, but all into this like one world, one space, many things to do. What are the possibilities there? How far can it go? Um, and for 16 straight years, you know, we covered that game from day one till or roughly, you know, early on anyway, till um, till a couple of years ago. And coming back to it's going to be really fun because we're about to head into some new areas of innovation within that game and else and outside of it. And so uh, I guess the long or the very long story short, um, gaming is my I'm trying to think what it would be like, you know, some people really zero in on. Uh, let's say uh, LLMs right now in AI, like they're really fascinated with it. Large language models are their jam now. And this might be their whole career looking forward because this is what, what path they're on. That was gaming for me. And it happened when I was about seven or eight years old and it never really left. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. What, um, what I was reminded of while you were kind of talking about gaming not just being like, oh, yeah, that's a really cool game, but kind of like the artistry and the going a level deeper on what it means to create or, you know, craft an experience. Again, kind of going beyond just the surface level, that's a neat game, and going into the next, uh, well, the next generation. I imagine that uh, you probably were aware back in the day of the Next Generation magazine. Oh, I loved did, it. Did you? Yeah. Loved it. 
Yeah. And I loved it for exactly the reason that you're talking about, because back in the day, and mind you, when I was reading Next Generation, it was probably, I, th I think I was working in a, I was working in a pawn shop at the time, mm -hmm. and the pawn shop had a separate hut, like a, uh, like an outside hut outside of the, the standard pawn shop that was their video game area. Mm -hmm. And so I would sit there all day and not make, you know, very much money and just wait for <laughs> kids to bring in their old systems and their, their stockpile of games and, you know, offer them far too little for them and then just play <laughs> games all day and while i was there i really got into next generation magazine and primarily for the reason that you're talking about because it wasn't just like oh yeah and you can go here in this game and it's really neat when you get the level boss or whatever it was it was going deep into the industry into the mentality and the thinking around this craft that like you said was was really building up in a way that we hadn't seen before this interactive storytelling uh, yeah, method. and that was that was the era too where things. It's weird to call it an era because it feels like we just went through it, but it really truly was <laughs> yeah. an era. But it was an era of, um, you know, before the internet took everything over. Yeah. Uh, in terms of publishing and you know this sort of thing, and there's a reason why Next Generation and most of the venerable gaming magazines of yore are gone. Most recently, mm -hmm. Game Informer just just got closed after 33 years or something of. Um, wow. Yeah, it was a real bummer. It's a GameSpot yeah. thing or stop thing, so whatever. We could go into that sometime. But um, the writing was on the wall for this sort of thing, and Next Generation didn't didn't really know a good, they didn't really know how to bridge it. But when they were at their peak, that's when I first started to notice. Oh, we're not just talking about how many pixels can I get on a screen? Mm -hmm. You know, how many sprites can move at once? You know, these kinds of discussions that you would have or even early polygonal stuff like well playstation can push this many polygons but it can't do this with textures and 64 can i mean those are all interesting technical discussions but where next generation and others really kicked it off for me was they started talking about what's possible and not just what's coming they did a lot of that but it was also about well if this zelda game can do this just imagine what we could do here once this once we clear this technical hurdle or this storytelling telling hurdle or we stop having load times that are at, you know terminal or whatever um that's that's so much fun to follow that progress and then mm -hmm. to experience that progress and then to talk about that progress with people you like it's it's difficult to to not want to do it um the other thing I loved about Next Generation, this is a silly, very base level thing, but their paper quality and cover stock oh, was so yes. nice. Oh, man. Totally. I love totally. it. I love it the feel felt, of it. It felt like a different, yeah, it felt like a different video game magazine. All the other ones felt very surface level and very much like kind of aimed at the kids. Mm -hmm. Next Generation felt like a magazine that was aimed at the more discerning mm -hmm. gamer, you oh, know, yeah. it, down yeah. to the card stock where you picked it up and you're like, this feels like more expensive and it was more expensive but you know it it felt like a more premium experience i loved it i absolutely loved that i magazine. still have all of them i got a whole box over there it's just stacked with them oh, i'll never wow. get rid of them but i used yeah. to think oh man one of my goals was to get i wanted to get a comic or some art in one of those i never did it i regret it i just didn't try that hard but yeah. uh but yeah like that stuff and that aspect of the industry has always been interesting to me that's why right now i mean this is an announcement i've been working on this for a little while but I want to make a zine and I want to do it. You're more and more of that. actually. Yeah. Yes. I mean, people are, there's a nostalgia for it, but there's also, yes. there's something exciting about turning away from pure digital a little bit for just a second. We're not going to avoid it entirely, right? We're not going all yeah. troglodyte or anything. I wouldn't want to, but, <laughs> but I love the idea of here is a, even, even if it's just a PDF, but here is a curated short form thing with interesting stuff in it that you can hold in your hand and, and yeah. you know, just that that vibe. I want to do that so bad. For sure, I'm gonna do it. I just don't know when I'm gonna have time, but I'm gonna do it. Make one. sure, make sure that when you ship it, it, it ships with like a cassette tape um, <laughs> or something like that. Just to just to close the loop on it. Yeah. I think they'd go hand in hand, like a PlayStation One <laughs> demo disc or something like that. <laughs> I miss those days. I really do. I mean, you know, it's not a zine, but you do have. You know, the definitive uh, collection, which mm -hmm. I have, the Extra Life uh, definitive collection. Yeah, the Extra Life definitive. I have definitive. a huge amount of respect for the fact that you were able to, A, produce so much artwork that it fits inside of a book, and B, to produce a book of it, like a coffee table style book. It's beautiful. Yeah, the only downside I would learn, this is a lesson I learned from making that book, was, um, you know, first of all, I was 
great to just take all the old stuff and, and put it in one place. That felt great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then that was 2015. I look at my world now. We're almost 10 years on, right? Yeah. That was and a while I go, ago, yeah. yeah. And I go, so much. I, I, for those who are worried that you're, if you start drawing now, you'll never improve. I promise you, you will, whether you know it or not. I look at my work now and I look at it 10 years ago and I go, ugh, my gosh, that stuff was bad. So part of me loves that book. And part of me hates it because it represents really? old art that if I could do it again, I would redo a bunch of it because I yeah. don't think it's as good. It does, and again, this is what you do to yourself. This is another people telling me this, this is me telling myself this. Um, right. Not that unusual, but that was an interesting lesson. Um, and it also coincided with when I stopped doing that comic as a regular. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is a perfect chance for it. It's just been running this long. Let's put it in book form. Let's Let's seal the deal on this one. And I look back on it now and I'm like, oh, I should have kept making them. I'd have, I'd have a book two by now. And, you know, I have enough art to fill another book, but they're not specific to the Extra Life comic. And so yeah. maybe that'll happen too. I have a children's book underway right now with my daughter, Excellent. Uh, who is an amazing artist in her own right. Yes. And is yes. going into gaming as well because she graduated with a degree in game design um, from college. And she's, that just tells you how old I am. I'm getting freaking old. <laughs> we all are. Time comes for us all. Yeah. I'm happy that you brought up your daughter because this is something that I did want to um, want to ask you about or, or talk with you about a little bit. Is sure one thing that I've noticed that has been really that I really respect about the work that you do is that you you have looked for opportunities to bring your family into what you do, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know the the mechanics of how that happened or has happened over the years, but you have a podcast with uh, your wife, Kim, called mm-hmm. Skim. You've mm-hmm. got the Monday show with your daughter, mm-hmm. Carter, also kind of the art. And I don't know, like, I'm just kind of curious because I have I have done, you know, largely in, in my career, and I think maybe this is changing for me now as my kids get a little older, mm-hmm. but I have largely kind of put my family in a different part of my life and Mm -hmm. then had my career separate of them because I didn't want to like cross the stream. Sure. And I'm just kind of curious about your experience crossing the streams on, on that. Cause it seems, it seems like it would be very fulfilling. And, you know, I am starting to kind of integrate and, and ask my, my daughters and stuff like, Hey, can I, you know, can I have you as an example for this thing that I'm testing out and it'll be in a video. So I'm getting their permission and all that stuff. But what's, what's your, what's your thought on that? Well, so my my having children and then raising them those years coincided almost exactly with the advent of the internet as we know it you know the world wide web and forward really uh my oldest daughter is she was born in 94 that was the year i'd first seen the internet hmm. uh and it's you know sort of usable format forget about all the you know 60s and 70s and the arpanet and all that um and for whatever reason, it just all seemed to go together. It's it's very strange. Uh, my son, my youngest, who is now 24, was four <laughs> when I started the instance. And I used his voice for a segment in the show that was just emails, but it was called The Town Crier. And I had him do a little fake cry and a hear ye, hear ye sound and all that. <laughs> and um, And it was just this thing. I thought, well, it's just kind of cute. You know, whatever, we'll do it. I'm so glad I did it because here he is 24 years later and he has a kid of his own now. He's got a brand new baby. And to be able to look back and see that is really a great feeling. And in fact, I think this will, yeah, this will play for you. Um, I decided to make a new version of that clip for this new launching show, which happens tomorrow. And I thought this would be a fun way to do it. So I'm just going to play this real quick here. Here you go. So this combines... Him when he was little, him now. I can't wait. And then I have a five-year-old grandbaby. Uh, I guess not a baby anymore. He's five years old. He also did a little bit in it. So anyway, I'll just play. It's very brief. So let's just yeah. play this real quick. Check it out. Oh, I may not. Is it playing through there? No, I can't hear it. Oh, I, I just realized it. I don't. StreamYard's not going to pick it up. Darn it. Uh, oh. You know what I'll do? I'll send it over to you and you can do something with I it can, if you want. Yeah, I can loop that in. Yeah, send uh, it to me. But it's, oh, that was incredible. That was so it. good. Oh. Can you believe it? <laughs> but, the idea, but the idea of bringing that full circle this yeah. many years later is a really 
love that. Neat thing. Oh. And that's just one little thing, right? Like the kids have always been involved in some way. I'm pretty sure my daughter's interest in both games and art, and she is demonstrably better than me at her age, yeah. especially. Like she's killing it. She's great. Um, yeah. I think a part of that is because we were always involving them in this stuff. And the other thing, you know, goes back to community, but the nerdtacular events that I used to run, we still do smaller ones. And I have one in Vegas we do every year for our morning show. But back in the day, we'd have, you know, however many people we could fit into an event, all come out to these big nerdtacular events. And, you know, Veronica and Tom and all these people would come. And, and my kids were always there for it. They would always get to see it. They would interact with the fans. They would be keeping score for the stuff we do on stage when we'd have contests, they were just involved. And I think that was, I didn't think about it at the time. At the time I was just like, well, this is my family. I take them wherever I go. That's, Mm -hmm. uh, I love my kids. So they're here, but it was a really good thing for them to experience that kind of interactivity, that kind of like, these are strangers to me, but they're nice. Um, you know, it's good for them to see community around this. And I think it I think it was a real benefit for them. So I'm really glad that I didn't do too much in the way of like trying to separate it. Um, and by the way, I completely get why people don't want to cross those streams always. Um, but I, 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 I think I, I think I erred on the side of like, well, you know, what's what's here's all the benefits to it. There's not really right. much of a downside and my community's awesome. There's no weirdos or freak nuts. And if they're they if they do show up, they leave real quick because they don't fit. You right, know, right? They're, they're in there for five minutes, and then somebody says, "Ban them," or they don't belong in yeah. here. Or we just know we can tell. It's 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 not that different than a family picnic, and a, a crack dealer shows up. Mm-hmm. Sh- show him the door. He doesn't he doesn't fit at the family picnic. It's like that. Right. And so because of that, I think they they had such a positive experience with those extemporaneous factors around my work that, that they are, I think they're, they're just better modeled people as a result of all that interaction with all those, you know, awesome people over the years. I'm so happy I got the chance to ask that question because it's it's very inspiring. I mean, I, yeah, I certainly find myself more wanting more to rope them in. Stacy and I have talked about, you know, the potential of, of launching a podcast at some point <laughs> when there's time. I mean, mm. that's that's the problem is that the time is a limited resource and it's always really challenging to figure that out. But absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, these are things that that couldn't have happened prior because I wasn't doing my thing. I was doing someone else's thing. Mm-hmm. And now it, you know, it, it, it allows for, for certain things like that. My, my older daughter last, uh, last year, you know, she just started ninth grade, but mm. last year was her last year at her, um, K through eight school. And one of her projects was to, to do a podcast, you know? Mm. And so it was really cool to kind of see her on that side. Although I was, you know, she didn't really ask my opi- my opinion or for advice very much through that. So I was kind of like, oh, here's just your dad over here, the you know, career podcaster. But she did great. She mm-hmm. didn't need it, you mm-hmm. know? So it's just, it's cool to kind of see those those streams crossing and kind of square that up with my my thinking prior, which was, oh, I got I to gotta protect the family. Like, I, I don't know who sees these things and, right, and right. whatever. And, and you're, if you're, you're it's like having... That community helps. Yeah, not being... I guess that's the key, right? Because if I was just Joe Streamer and it's just tons of people watching you play Call of Duty or something, yeah, I think that's a different prospect because you're there and there can be community around that. I'm not saying there isn't, but it's, it's mm-hmm. just not the same level of it takes a village when you cultivate a community that is just so connected to what you're doing and it's a reasonable size, you know, it's not billions of people or many millions of people. It's thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands, but still it's a, it's a, it's a better scale. Mm -hmm. Then you can a control those things a little better, but also B you surround yourself with good nurturing minds, people that, are excited to see my kids succeed and I'm excited to see their families grow. Like it's an exchange that if it, that you can make very tangible and they are not just a name on a screen scrolling past. If you mm-hmm. can do that, then I think this, I think that loosens all of that up with your kids. For me, it did. For sure. 
Yeah. 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 That's amazing. I love it. You're super inspirational, sir. I really enjoy uh, having you as a friend and a, uh, a, you know, at times an advisor and advice giver, but you're just, I love your sense of humor. I love how incredibly talented you are. You are so talented at the art that you do and, and being authentic, being yourself on your podcast. You just, you're, you're awesome at what you do. Oh, thanks, really man. You. Feeling is mutual, and I'm really yeah. glad we finally got a chance to, you know, really sit down and do this. And now we'll remember That's where it. we met this time, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write it. I'm going to print it out on a big sheet of paper and put it above my monitor. So every day I, I read it and I go, That's right. We, we met in Vegas. That's in right. Yeah. 2008. Well, it was Las Vegas, okay? <laughs> no one remembers anything in Vegas. No That's one remembers point. anything in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott, so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, because I know you do a lot. Um, it's been wonderful uh, talking with you on the Text Floater podcast. Thanks, thank man. People. Uh, yeah. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, is, if people want to kind of follow everything that you're doing, uh, where do you prefer people go? Frogpants.com? I think frogpants.com will get you there. All my stuff's there. All my socials are there. All my bits of work and all the podcasts, everything's out there for the taking and uh, easy ways to contact Goodness. me. So if you get any questions or thoughts or feelings or whatever, uh, just let me know. And if you are a world of Warcraft fan or even just a fan of like top down video game discussion of that industry, uh, check out the instance, which again relaunches as instance 2.0 uh, as soon as tomorrow. So uh, very excited to be bringing that back. And uh, again, thank you for having me, man. This is a big, a real pleasure for me. Oh, I really appreciate it. And let's let's do it again sometime. Sounds good. Let's do it again. Let's make it happen. Thank you again, Scott. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Appreciate you. All right. Big thanks to our guest, Scott Johnson. Thanks to you for watching and listening. We could not, by the way, do this show without your support. Talk about community. We've got an amazing community that uh, helps do you know helps us do this show each and every week. That is you. The most direct way that you can support this show and everything that I'm doing with Textbloater is at the Patreon, patreoncom slash Jason Howell. Uh, and you, you know, you go there, I try and give you things that, that you find value in. Although most people, you know, fill out the survey and they say, we just want to see this work. And so I appreciate that deeply, but you also get things like ad free shows, early access to videos. You get a discord, uh, access to our, our community on discord, which we're still, you know, doing what we can to kind of build it and grow it and get people engaged and active and everything like that. Um, you know, so having you in there would be wonderful. We also have an exclusive patrons only pre-show live stream every week before the episode uh, is premiered on the YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash at Jason Howell, or sorry, at Texploder. If you want to uh, get the live stream or sorry, the, <laughs> let me try that again. YouTube.com slash at Texploder. If you want to find the episodes when they're published, if you want the pre-show, you got to be the patron. So patreon.com slash Jason Howell. Um, we also offer the chance to be an executive producer of this show, just like this week's executive producers, Bill Rudder, Jeffrey Maricini, John Cuny. And actually, we have a new executive producer, Taylor Sunderhaas. Taylor, thank you so much for signing up. Appreciate having you on board. That is patreon.com slash Jason Howell. As for this podcast, we record this every, uh, every week and release it on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Eastern on the Textbloder YouTube channel. Again, that's youtube.com slash at Textbloder. Uh, the audio pod, uh, podcast publishing later to the feeds that day. So if you're subscribed, then you'll get that. And really everything you need to know can be found at textbloder.com. And real quick note, if you subscribe to the podcast on Pocket Casts, they actually just put out a new update on their app that allows you to give a rating to your podcast. So go to the Text Bloater podcast uh, entry on, pod, on Pocket Cast and give us a rating. It really helps us out. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for watching and listening. Thank you again to Scott Johnson. And I'm Jason Howell. We'll see you next time on another episode of the Text Bloater podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.